Gene, it's so good to have you with us. And, uh, and Adriana and Annie. Yeah. Uh, 606, why don't we stand and we'll sing this together. Believeth me, O blessed God. sent to this earth that not only that we might have life, but that he might grant life to the whole world. Father, you are calling out a people for your name. A people who will be the bride of your son. The most awesome calling, Father, in the history of mankind. Thank you that you've called us. Thank you that we hear you. And that you ask us now to walk in in obedience, to walk in the footsteps of your Son in every way. That we may respond to life and life situations as he would. Thank you for every head bowed and for those who are viewing, Father, on video. May you bless the brotherhood around the world as they gather in this day. May your blessings be upon each as we anxiously await for that time when your son shall return. We thank you for the sentiments of this hymn, Father, that we acknowledge that you lead us and you guide us and you direct us every step of the way. May we surrender ourselves to that premise And so, Father, we uh, mourn with our brother Kurt and the loss of his dad, but we thank you for the hope that we have that serves as an anchor to our souls. Thank you for the promises that you have made and kept. 
Thank you for the promises that have yet to be met. We know that they are yea and amen because we know that your word is sure and true. And so, Father, uh, we leave now this meeting in your care and keeping, asking that the power of your Holy Spirit would be mightily upon our brother Bruce as he leads us in the study of your word today. May the things that we hear, the things that we share together, uplift us and strengthen us in our most holy faith. And at the end of all things, we'd be able to say, it was good to have been here this day. We thank you and praise you in the blessed name, the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 611, precious Lord, take my hand. said to them, follow me. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When the United States launched its space program in 1958, seven men were chosen to become first astronauts. Imagine the excitement. Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Walter Schirra, Alan Shepard, and Deke Slayton. They were scheduled to go where no one had ever gone before. Yet as astronauts, they knew they would face unseen, unforeseen dangers, challenges, and trials. Each of them realized that the thrill of being chosen was tempered with the fear of an unknown future. Imagine another set of men who were chosen for an important mission. The 12 apostles Jesus chose one day on a mountainside near the Sea of Galilee. These men left behind their occupations, their families, to dedicate themselves to this radical new teaching. They didn't know what kind of political, religious, or financial challenges they would face. Yet, they followed Jesus. Jesus asked the same of his people today. He asks each one of us to follow him, to love him, 
to obey him and to tell others about him. Like the apostles, we don't know what our commitment to Jesus might bring. Lord, help us to follow you faithfully and to trust you completely with our future. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lord, help us to trust him completely with our future. Holy words, words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope. In this world where e'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. And of course, the ancient words that this song is describing is the words, the word of God. Words of life, words of hope, that do give us strength and the power to help us cope in this challenging world. These ancient words teach us how to daily follow Jesus. Ancient words, ever true, changing me and changing you. I hope each of us can say that. We've come now with open hearts. We'll let the ancient words impart.
we read in part that there are those who will wage war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them, etc., etc. And those who are with Him, those who are with the Lamb, are called chosen and faithful. For all our many differences of understanding of exactly how, when, if, and who there may be, I feel safe in saying that if given our druthers, our choice, we want to be with those who are coming with the Lamb, to be among the called, chosen, and faithful. Brethren, there is a general call of the good news of the gospel message, a call to all men to repentance, to come and receive the gift of God's grace, Jesus Christ, and through faith in Him receive the forgiveness of their sins, that is promised to all who put their faith and trust in God through faith in the blood of the Lamb. It is the good news the angels heralded that will be to all people a Savior is born. God's promise to Abraham that through thee and thy seed all peoples of the earth shall be blessed. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. The mystery that was kept secret for generations is now revealed. God has made a way that sinful man can be reunited, reconciled back to their creator. Jesus Christ is the propitiation not only for our sins, not only for the sins of believers, but for the sins of the whole world. The gospel of the kingdom came to earth nearly 2,000 years ago with God's anointed one, Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave it to the twelve and told them to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Then he gave it to the seventy and told them to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom. For nearly 2,000 years, the gospel in many forms has been spread. I would suggest that the fact that there is estimated to be some 41,000 current Christian denominations 
that that is testimony to the fact that Satan had been hard at work polluting the pure word of God and the unity which one flock, one shepherd is to generate. Where is the gospel of the kingdom preached today? For the billions who lived prior to Jesus' first advent, for the billions and billions over the last 2,000 years who have never heard of Jesus Christ, for the billions who have heard the only name by which man might be saved, but Satan has blinded to the glorious gospel message. Where is the good news of the kingdom extolled to all these? Most preach today that man's opportunity to know and accept God's grace and mercy ends at death or when Jesus returns. Please forgive my round figures here, but I only need you to focus on the big picture. With some eight plus billion on earth today, we're told 31%, about two and a half billion claim to be Christian and acknowledge the only name by which man might be saved. After 2,000 years of spreading the gospel, that still leaves two out of three of all those on the earth, about five and a half billion, they are, oh well, lost. And this is the best case scenario. This is as good as it gets. The numbers going back 2,000 years are nowhere near as good as these lofty percentages of today. How minuscule was the world percentage of Christians in the first and second century. For that matter, until the press was invented. And even now with modern communications, we can speak around the world. And yet, still two thirds of the globe are still non-Christian. Oh well. No, 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 brethren. It's not just oh well to them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. No way, brethren, no way is the Almighty, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, going to say, Oh well, to the vast majority, certainly more than 75% of all his beloved creation. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. God's grace and mercy for all those Oh well ones we're speaking about the supposed lost and far worse does not end with death or Jesus' return. The due time, the due time for all these supposed lost ones will be testified to in the thousand year day of judgment. When all who are in the graves come forth, Satan and all his minions will be bound so they can deceive no more. In the resurrection to judgment, men will learn righteousness, and the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the water covers the sea. And men will learn righteousness. Men will learn about Jesus Christ. Where is the gospel of the kingdom preached today? This brings us to the called, chosen, and faithful. And as that pertains to our theme, accepting God's call. As the gospel call goes out to all mankind to come to God through Jesus Christ, that message falls on those who hear it, and the invitation goes to all who hear it. For sure, brethren, 
something ends. Something ends when Jesus returns and brings this age to its conclusion. It will not be the end of God's grace. It will not be the end of God's eternal plans and purposes in Christ Jesus. It will not be the end of God's judgments upon all his beloved creation for whom he gave his own son. For a time is coming when all who are in the grave will hear the voice of the Son of Man and come forth to a resurrection of judgment, to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness reigns and where Isaiah tells us, for when your judgment are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Isaiah 26, 9. But yes, yes indeed, something comes to an end when Jesus, the groom, returns for his beloved, long, long waited for bride. The bride has been completed. Then the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Then the door of opportunity to claim the inheritance God holds for us in heaven shall be shut. The eternal bride of Jesus Christ is complete then off to the wedding of the Lamb. That is what ends, never to be offered again. When Jesus returns, the clock strikes twelve. The bride will be taken and God will pour out his fury and wrath on all sin. In this age, God is calling out a people for his name a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This age is for the selecting and perfecting of a people for his name, that they may proclaim the praises of him and make disciples of all nations in this age and in the millennial age, proclaim the pure gospel with saved and bound to all the billions and billions who died in darkness. Once and for all times, Jesus has dealt with the sin of Adam. In the thousand year day of judgment, God's called, chosen, and faithful will lead the world of mankind all who will follow up the highway of holiness out of darkness into the marvelous night light of the knowledge of God's mercy and grace which is found only in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world God predestined that he would have sons adopted to himself through Jesus Christ and conform to his likeness. They would become his sons, given an eternal inheritance of glory, honor, and immortality. They would be heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Out of those to whom the general call goes out, there are those who are chosen, picked out, elect to hear and understand the gospel of the kingdom. In Matthew 13, the disciples come and they ask Jesus why he speaks in parables, to which he answered, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. 
but blessed. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. To the elect, the chosen, blessed with eyes that see and ears that hear, to them is given a calling, a calling to run for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus, to run and claim that inheritance which is being held for us in heaven by God. We've been selected to a special calling. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1 26, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Nothing God does is arbitrary. It all is done with purpose and God's calling. His elect is no different. He is not throwing darts at billions of names to decide who he calls in this age to be a people for his name and who he doesn't. God calls and we accept God's call or not. Also in Matthew 13 we find the master's parable of the sower which foretells the heart condition upon which the gospel of the kingdom would and does fall among the called and chosen in this age. We're told the sower sows the seed, that is the gospel of the kingdom, and it falls on four types of ground. The first one Jesus talks about is the wayside. Verse 19 of Matthew 13 goes, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. One hears the gospel and just doesn't get it. They don't understand and Satan comes along and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Let me suggest the gospel sounds good and they wish it could be true, but you know it's not logical. There's no science to prove it. Satan deceived Eve with logic, which she accepted over God's word. The second is the stony place. Verses 20 and 21 read, But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulations and persecutions arise because of the word, immediately he stumbles. The stony place is the heart that hears of the kingdom and immediately receives it with great joy, yet has no root in himself. Let me remind us that we are branches and we must abide in the vine. Jesus says in John 15, 3, I am the vine you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The branch has no root in itself. No matter how vigorously and joyfully one receives the kingdom message, they cannot sustain themselves. They must be continuously fed and nourished they must stay attached to the vine, Jesus Christ, for strength, or they dry up and they become brittle. They accept the good news with joy, but reject staying attached to the only way back to God. When the inevitable trouble comes because of the gospel, they stumble 
they are gone. The third falls among the thorns. Verse 22 reads, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Plain enough, is it not? We cannot serve both God and mammon. Many try to straddle the fence to live in both worlds. Choose this day who you will serve. And fourthly, seed falls on the good ground. Verse 23, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The good ground hears and accepts the grace of God, accepts the free gift of salvation through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The faith of the good ground is not a dead faith that produces no fruit. James tells us faith without works is dead. So God has predestined a bride for his son and those who make up that bride will be the good ground that will come forth from the called and the chosen. Brethren, in Numbers 13 and 14, we read of the 12 Israelite scouts that were sent out to see the land of milk and honey which God had given them and to report back what they saw and how they would actually take the land and run out the, cur the current inhabitants. They returned and there was no question about it. It was plain to see that the land was everything that God said it was. Indeed, a land of milk and honey. It was also plain, plain to see that it was just a dream a fairy tale that there was no way the giants that inhabited the land could be run out. It was like the local Pee Wee football team going to defeat the New England Patriots. We were like grasshoppers in our eyes, they said. All twelve returned. All twelve saw the same. All twelve knew the obvious conclusion that there was no way in their power they could take the land that God had given them. Ten of the twelve gave the no way report, and yet two, two came to a different conclusion. The two, they saw the same land, They saw the same fortifications. They saw the same mighty armies. They saw the same giants. They contradicted nothing of what was seen and offered. They offered no strategy of how they would do it. Yet Caleb just stood up before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. The guy is crazy. He's a dreamer. That land devours its inhabitants, says the other ten. Then both Caleb and Joshua stood before Moses and the whole congregation and laid out the whole plan. 
if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. It was Newt Rockney-esque. And the congregation rose, and they cried in unison, Take the land! Not exactly. Not exactly. Stone them with stones. How do you think that's set with God? I can tell you. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? That we can be holy as God is holy, I would suggest to you is every bit as impossible as the Israelites being able to drive the giants out of the promised land. Only do not rebel against the Lord. About 600,000 fighting men, aged men, came out of Egypt and they were given the promised land. They were shown great signs and miracles, and they were told to go claim their inheritance. All they needed to do was believe God and run. And due to disbelief and the absence of faith in God's ability to deliver on his promise of the inheritance, the land he gave them because of the giants which were in the way, they wandered in the desert for 40 years until all those 600,000 men were reduced down to the two, the two that believed God. And they, with another cast of characters who were born in the desert, finally entered the promised land and began claiming it. Man's disbelief and rejection of God's inheritance did not take it away. God's plans and purposes go forth, and God will have his way. The only question is, who will believe God, and who will go at once and claim the inheritance which he is holding for us? God has predestined before the world began a bride for his son and we have been called and we have been chosen and given an inheritance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Brethren, it is your inheritance. Just as God gave the promised land, the land of milk and honey, the 600,000 redeemed slaves out of Egypt, and told them to go take the land, claim the inheritance he gave them, God calls us to run, to run and claim our inheritance. The giants that were so plain to see and made the taking of the promised land so obviously impossible for the Israelites, impossible in any logical and reasonable assessment of the reality of their situation caused them to refuse to go, refuse to run, refuse to claim and take the land God gave them. We have similar 
We have similar giants to keep us mixed up in God's call. To keep us from running and claiming our inheritance today. What sinner doesn't know that it's impossible for them to be holy as your Father in heaven is holy? That they are unworthy to be called and incapable of finishing and claiming the inheritance God has called us to. I can give you a thousand reasons why it is impossible for me to be holy as my Father in heaven is holy. Sherry can probably give you 2,000 reasons why I can't. I am like a grasshopper in my eyes before this insurmountable, gigantic obstacle of holiness. And yet, I can give you one reason, only one reason why I can. God is faithful. God is faithful. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Six hundred thousand men were given the land and all but two died in 40 years of doing donuts in the desert due to their sin of disbelief. After 40 years of sojourners in the desert, Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land and claimed their inheritance. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12. We each individually have separate weights which slow us down, and accumulatively, they can grind us to a near halt if they're not shed. But I would suggest that we all have to deal with the sin that so easily ensnares us, and that is the sin of disbelief. The giants whose protection had been removed and were defeated, never had to lift a sword to defeat any of the 600,000 Israelites because they did not believe God. Satan's protections have been removed and he is defeated. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Revelations 12, 12. Satan's reign of terror over the sons of man also runs out his clock when it strikes 12. When the king of kings and the lord of lords returns for his bride. Be sober. Be vigilant, Peter says, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. This lion has no teeth. He deceives the whole world with his lies, and he scares the very elect and the called and chosen with the power of his roar and the giants he manipulates and puts onto the course that we are called to run. And if the roar doesn't work, and the giants don't work, he always has his greatest weapon, the lie. He is the father of lies and a murderer from the start. He is the lying king. I can hear Satan in my, whispering in my ear saying 
God is calling you. Are you kidding me? You, Blakey, out of all the martyrs and genius, geniuses of the past 2,000 years from which to pick, he is going to settle for a simpleton like you? Hey, Blakey, how is that, uh, you know, holy as your Father in heaven is holy? How's that working out for you? You know, you've been at it for 38 years now. Oh, man, you must be right there. You must be just inches from perfect, right? Remember what you did yesterday? And oh, what about last week? You remember that last week? Holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Oh, you got to be right there, right, Blakey? Blakey, do you know what you gave up? Do you know what I can do and give you with all that time you're wasting, chasing after fairy tales and impossibilities? You know they're impossible. You suppose that you're a little bit better person? And I'll give you a little. Maybe after 30 years, you might be a couple steps closer to being a little more holy. At least a little more than you were when you began. But let's face it, you've got light years to go. You're 72 years old, remember. How much time do you think you got left to cover those light years of ground to make up? Why waste them? Blakey, you're old and you're so much slower now. It takes you twice as long to do what little you used to do. And you're forgetting far more than you retain. And you're telling me you're going to hold out for perfect? Oh, Blakey, you are a simpleton. Brethren, Satan has and uses his all science so-called, all human logic and reason to prove to us either God does not exist or he does not or will not keep his promise, that God can't do the impossible. We can see with our own eyes. And only reason that we can't be holy as God is holy. But brethren, we live by faith, not by sight. Without faith it is impossible to please God, and without a well-pleased God it is impossible to take the inheritance of the prize of the high calling. But with belief in God. The inheritance is ours. Believe it. I think it's quite impressive that Satan with a defeated army of giants whose protection was gone defeated 600,000 men with just fear and unbelief alone. But that's nothing. Consider this. For nearly 2,000 years, the gospel calling has gone out to billions, and a few billion of those billions have heard the call and have chosen and were chosen and given eyes to see. And God's Holy Spirit to taste the good things of their promised inheritance. Yet Satan, the defeated one, has and continues to defeat them without even a battle because they don't believe they can or even know of their need to take and claim their inheritance. The same defeated Satan whose protection has been, made, has been removed in the face of the cross of Jesus Christ continues with a fearful roar of a lion 
He continues with his gigantic lies. And he continues to leave billions in the desert of disbelief. Brethren, give the devil his due. Give the devil his due. He's an impressive adversary. But he is a loser. He defeated 600,000 men with fear and disbelief and never lifted a sword. But he could not defeat. He could not defeat the two old men who were left. Even after 40 years of watching his fearful brothers drop in the desert, let us go up at once and take possession. For we are able to overcome it. Satan could not defeat. Satan could not deny the two who put their trust and belief in God until the end. And those two took possession of their inheritance. As, as impossible as it was supposed to be. Brethren, our theme this week is accepting God's call. I'm afraid I've probably spent too much time on those who reject it and still reject God's call and not near enough on the few who are called, chosen, and faithful, those who accept his call. Many are called, but few are chosen, and brethren, far fewer are those who are called, chosen, and faithful. In the case of the Israelites, it was one in every 300,000 men. What was it about those two that made them special? They believed God. They believed God when he told them that he had given them the land he promised to their forefathers against all their eyes and human experiences told them, against all human logic, reason, and common sense, against the cries and screams of the whole world around them as they blared, we can't take the land, Joshua and Caleb believe God. Let's go at once. God's plan and purpose was to give the land to this generation and he did he gave it to them and all but two through disbelief proved themselves to be unworthy of that inheritance so God gave it to the next generation led by the only two faithful ones who believed God over everything they saw and everything they knew. God's plans and purposes go on and they will be done. God will have his desire. God has predestined before the world began that his only begotten would have a bride conform to his likeness and be co-heirs with him. God will have his way. For 2,000 years, God had been selecting and perfecting a people for his name and a bride for his son. From out of the called and chosen, God with patience and long suffering waits for the completion of that bride. The inheritance is ours. God has given it to us. Believe God? I mean, really, do you believe God? You see all the giants that stand between you and be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. You see all the so called science, you know the logic and reason and the shouts from the world around us that we are nuts. But the greater danger, the greater danger to our inheritance is the sin that so easily ensnares us. Our inheritance will die in the desert of 
of disbelief. None of the giants can stop you. If you believe and run, go, go and take the inheritance. But this I know, if we don't run, we don't win. We won't win if we don't know what we are running for. Nobody wakes up one Monday in May and decides to go for a jog only to find out after that they have just won the Boston Marathon. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one, one wins the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. We need to know what we're running for. And all else we do must be distant seconds in importance. We need to be like Paul, this one thing I do, this one thing I do. In Ephesians 1, Apostle Paul prays for us who are the elect, the called, and chosen, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. The hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? It is my understanding that there are some among us that understand the high calling and the bride have been completed. God has not shown me that yet. And I can only maintain my integrity by sharing with you what God has shown me. That's what I've been called to do. Everything he has shown me to date is that we are to believe God and to run. He has my inheritance in heaven and if if I can say, as Paul did at my end, I have finished the course, I have fought the good fight, and I have believed God to the end, and my faith was not dead, I did the good works God had prepared for me to do, then I will have claimed that inheritance God gave me, and I will have accepted God's call. So to end this conference on accepting God's call and our consideration of the call chosen and faithful, again, I will close with the words of Joshua and Caleb. If the Lord delights in us, without faith it's impossible to please God. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And so I exhort all, the call and chosen, to run till the, till the end, making your calling and election sure to be among the called, chosen, and faithful who will come with the Lamb. And to that, what is our reply? Stone them with stones, or where are my sneakers? May God add his blessing.
Brethren, let us join our hearts in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, creator of the heavens and earth, giver of every good and perfect gift, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for this time that has been ours. We thank you for the great work which your brethren have put in to enable us to bring this conference to many in a different form. That your loved ones might be encouraged and uplifted as you have uplifted the CBC brethren for 111 years before us we trust that you will do the same this year. Heavenly Father, we pray, we look forward to the day, hopefully next year at Gordon College, should the Lord tarry. But we look forward to a time when we will gather together once again, face to face, to be able to hug and to share with each other the marvelous things that you continue to do in our lives. Father, we look forward to that day, for we know there will be a great reunion. We look forward to the Lord Jesus Christ's return and our being lifted with him. So Father, keep us strong, Keep us ever growing spiritually, endeavoring to produce that fruit that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Father, till we meet again. Keep us strong. Father, we ask all this in and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Six oh seven.
Let us join our hearts in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we do again humbly come and bow before you, Father, thankful and grateful for the opportunity that is ours to come in this morning and to consider your some of the deep things of your word, Father. Father, we know all your words, every one in the scriptures have been saved for these thousands of years to teach and instruct us, Father. So we pray for your spirit to help us to understand, to show us the things that we need to know, and to have faith that you will take care of the rest. Father, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to know of the calling which has gone out to the church in this age, and will go out to the world of mankind in the next. Father, we are especially mindful of our dear brother Kurt this morning and, and pray for your, your comfort and, and uh, assurances for him. We are mindful of his, of his mother, Father, with this great loss and, and, and pray that uh, you will give Kurt the comforting words to go with his loving spirit to, to comfort her and, all, and, the, and whatever f other family there is, Father. These are always times difficult, but as we say, we have the great hope, the sure hope that we will see our loved ones once again. And that your desire is that all, all mankind be saved and come to the accurate knowledge of God and the truth. So Father, we thank you and we praise you and we ask all these things that you be with us this week. Help us contemplate on these scriptures and, and, and how they go, go together and that they will reflect on your great love, strength, wisdom, powers. Father, we ask all these things through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to your honor and glory. Amen. Amen.